Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Pash, and I'm joined by my colleague Mark Drakes, and we're both from New York University, and we'll be presenting on integrating Google Apps for Education with Sakai, with a little help from Group. So here's just a quick agenda. Um, we'll give a background of why we're doing this at NYU. We'll talk about some of the basic requirements for this integration. Um, and then we'll get into creating Google Groups based on Sakai sites. We'll look at sharing Google Drive items um, with permission syncing. And then we'll look at some of um, our open questions, um, because this is ongoing development at this point. Um, and we'll look at some of those tricky bits that we've come across. And then we'll get to your questions. So just for a quick background, um, NYU rolled out Google Apps for Education in 2010 to the university. So now all of our faculty, students, and staff um, use Gmail as their primary university email. Um, and they have the ability to use Google Drive and other Google Apps offerings. So for some time now, faculty have expressed interest um, in having an integration between Sakai and Google Groups. Um, and that's come through our user advisory group, which is comprised of faculty members and administrators. Um, and I also just learned from a presentation from New York University that in a recent survey to our faculty, they were asked what uh, other platforms besides Sakai they use in their teaching. And the two most popular responses were Google Drive and Google Docs. So this is definitely an area that we're interested in. So there have been many varied ideas and feedback on what an integration between Sakai and Google means. But if we just look to our sort of most basic requirements, we want the ability to create a Google Doc based on a Sakai site's memberships. And we want the ability to share a Google Drive item, so a Google Doc, a Google folder, et cetera, with the members of a Sakai site but have automatic syncing of permissions. So that is to say, if a student is dropped from that Sakai site, that you would see that reflected in the permissions of that associated Google Doc. So those are our basic requirements. So right now, instead of having to share a document with just individuals, we wanted a way to share with a, an entire course site. Um, and we're going to do that by using Google Groups. So we're dividing this presentation, um, as well as our own implementation, into two parts, or two phases. Um, so the first is to create Google Groups based on uh, Sakai Sites membership. Um, and the second is um, to be able to share those Google Drive items with the members of the site. Um, and I'll say that this is this right now, like I said, is a project that's in flight. And so this represents our working design. It's not a working prototype. Um, but it is informed by some testing um, that the technical team has done on the Google APIs and Grouper, which we'll talk about in a moment. We, saw, we have also gotten some early feedback um, from users um, on the design. Um, and as we get deeper into the development and get more feedback from users, um, the, the design will inevitably evolve as it should. <laughs> so at a simple level, we have memberships in Sakai sites. And we need some method for getting those memberships into Google Groups. We have to populate those Google Groups. Um, and we'll do that by talking to the Google APIs. So we could have done that directly, but we decided to put um, the software called Grouper in the middle as an intermediary. So what's Grouper? Um, so Grouper is Internet 2 middleware. It's designed for storing information on groups, roles, and permissions. Um, and it's architected in a way that allows other applications to easily <coughs> consume that data. So it's really built for groups. Um, by a strange coincidence, there is a Grouper for Beginners presentation right after this talk at 2 o'clock. I don't know if the person giving that is in this room. No, thanks for coming. 
<laughs> but I do recommend that you go to his presentation. Uh, but we'll talk more specifically about why we're using Grouper um, in this implementation. So, so as a first step to creating Google Groups based on a Sakai site, we wanted to give users a way to do this through the UI. So we would create a, a Google Groups tool, and this is what that would look like. So this is our current design for the tool. It would give users the ability to create a Google group for all the site participants in a site, whether they're in official rosters or if they're added you know, in an ad hoc way. You could create Google groups for specific sections. So if you just wanted section one to be part of a Google group and you just share documents with that certain section, you could do that. Or you could create Google groups for ad hoc groups that you create for your Sakai site. So it's important to point out, um, if you were in a Sakai site, the only groups that would show up as, you know, in the managed group section would be these ad hoc groups. These others are sort of, they're not created as groups in Sakai, but they're sort of framed here, so you have the ability to then say, I want a Google group. So um, clicking create Google group, things would not happen immediately. Um, it would be asynchronous, and, and Mark will talk about that a little more and the, and the reasons for that. Um, but based on initial testing, um, we believe that that sort of setting up of groups um, for, for an individual site can happen in seconds, um, and then it would just be a question of how many um, concurrent requests are, are coming in terms of how quickly we could, we could do that. But we, we see that based on initial tests as a fairly quick process. Um, so once that is created, you would be able to see um, that your Google group is created and that it has a unique name, a unique group name in Google that's related to the site name. So here we just used um, the, the course ID for the site along with a bit of the hash that's used as the site ID in Sakai. And so once that's created, the memberships of that of that Google group will then stay in sync with the Sakai site. And, that, and Mark will talk about that approach for how we're keeping those in sync. So like I said, I could also create a uh, group for section one. I'd get another unique group name and say that I decide, OK, I just want to share a document with group one. But wait, before I do that, am I sure or section one. Am I sure who's in section one? Am I getting my sections confused? So we wanted the ability to have a quick drop <coughs> down that'll just surface the membership of that section before I share the group. Still a safeguard. So at this point, what you could do is you could simply copy that email address associated with the group, or there's a nice little icon there for copy to clipboard. Pop over to a Google Doc and say share, and then the end result is that you have a Google Doc shared with that Section 1 course group, and that membership will stay in sync as students are added to Section 1 or dropped from Section 1. They'll be added or removed from that Google group, and therefore their permissioning on that Google Doc would change accordingly. So now Mark is going to talk about our approach for making this happen. Mark the trade. So the big idea here is that we have groups in Sakai that through this new tool have been marked as being shared with Google Groups. What that means is that we want the members of those groups in Sakai to be replicated across so that we have this parallel set of groups in Google with the same members. Uh, so the way we do this is by having Sakai taking data and sending to Grouper and then group ascending to Google through the Google API. So looking at the first bit of that, we have this group sync job, which is going to be watching Sakai for updates and then make corresponding updates to the group assistant. So the first step in having this sort of parallel sync is to look at the different ways that groups in Sakai can be changed. I'm trying to make a list of all the different ways that can happen. So the really obvious one is that users can be added and removed individually to sites, to sections, and to ad hoc groups, which are groups created by the instructor for a single site. Um, and that's pretty easy. So you know, a single user gets added to a group in Sakai, we make the same addition into Grouper, and then correspondingly, the same addition into the Google 
There are some more broad-reaching operations that are slightly more complex to carry out. So one example is sections can be added and removed from sites, and that's adding a lot of students at once to a site. And when that happens, we need to create a corresponding group for that section and then find all of the students and add them into that group. Uh, another one is that users can be marked as inactive within a site. So what that means is a student gets marked as inactive and then we need to go and find out all of the groups that they are a member of and remove them from those groups so that they no longer have access to those Google documents. Users' roles can change. So that's an example where, for example, a student becomes a teaching assistant and we need to have that information passed across as well. Uh, we've said already that ad hoc groups can be created and removed. So that's, for example, an instructor creating a group corresponding to a tutorial group or something like that. And we need to replicate those as well. And a slightly tricky one is that sites can be published and unpublished. So when a site is unpublished, we need to go through and remove all of the students from that site from any of the groups they were in. And conversely, when a site is published, we need to add all of the students back in again. So I guess the point of this is that a very small operation in Sakai can have this kind of cascading effect where we have to make a whole lot of updates to group them and then to Google. There might be other cases we haven't thought about, so if anyone thinks of any more, you can let us know. And so the challenge for us then when writing this, thing, this background job that's going to be watching Sakai is how does the job know when one of these things has happened? And there's no real single solution here. Most commonly, we're kind of imagining that this job is going to be polling Sakai periodically and looking at the database to try to work out what might have changed since we last looked. Uh, and we can mostly carry this out by looking at modification times in a couple of key tables. So, for example, we can look at the Sakai site table, and if we see a modification time for the last 30 seconds, then we might then say, okay, did the publication status of this change, or something like that. And there are a few other tables, like the realm tables and the um, provider tables that will also have this sort of information. There are some cases we've found where we might not have a timestamp like that that we can rely on. And in those cases, we are imagining that we will need to make code changes to add some sort of book to basically give our code a heads up when something interesting has happened. One example of that we've struck so far is we have a nightly job that pulls a data feed from our student system. And that's kind of the authoritative source of section membership, so which student is in which section. And currently, there's no obvious timestamp that tells us that a given section has had membership changes overnight. So we need some sort of mechanism for detecting that. So one example here is that we might change that data loader to actually keep track of which sections have changed. And the goal of all of this is to build some data feeds that we can basically use to drive group up. And ideally, we would like this data in two different forms. So the simplest one is we really just need a snapshot of for each site and for each group in each site, who's in it and what are their roles. So really just a table in the database that we can query to get a list of all of the current members from a single point in time. And we want this because it allows for a sort of reconciliation process between Grouper and Sakai. So the inevitable thing of trying to have two systems that you keep in sync is they're not going to be in sync. And so we really want to have a job that we can run, say, weekly, that just goes through them and makes sure that they more or less line up. And if they don't line up, then we can perform some sort of action to fix them up. The other thing we would like to have is more of an event stream. So you know, ideally, we would like just a stream of events in chronological order that say things like, the student MT1970 was added to group Foo on the 1st of April 2014. And if we have that sort of stream, then we can fire those events at group much more quickly. And this is in support of trying to make the whole thing fairly responsive. So you know, when an instructor clicks on something to add a, uh, to share a document with a group, we want that to come across very quickly. Or if they're adding a student to a group, we want that student to have access straight away. So a big challenge for us is finding out how real time can we actually get this. You know, how quickly can we get this data out of Sakai and into Grouper, and then subsequently from Grouper and into Google? And that's an open question for us. So a fair question is, why would we have Grouper here at all? You know, We have these two boxes. We have Sakai and Google. And really, we just want to funnel data from one to the other. So why would you have Grouper in the middle? It makes sense for NYU because it acts as a fairly convenient integration point. So we have several systems at NYU 
that would potentially like to access this information from Sakai. It would be really useful for them to be able to see which groups the site has and who's in them. And we don't really want those systems talking directly to the Sakai database, you know, where we, we upgrade Sakai and the schema changes and all of a sudden all of our other systems need to be updated as well. So group provides a standardized API that we can point all of these other systems to and we avoid having that real tight coupling with Sakai. Uh, it also acts as an indirection layer. So a nice thing is that we can potentially use Grouper to synchronize other things besides Google, you know, pushing data from Grouper to something else. Um, but it is the case that Grouper isn't strictly necessary. And you know, once we have these data feeds, then it should be possible to write a bunch of that talks directly from Sakai to whatever you want. And so the other half of this synchronization is taking the data that we now have in Grouper. So assuming we now have a, a perfect copy of the Sakai group membership sitting in Grouper, and then replicating that to Google as well. And so we have another sync job for this, which is very similar in spirit, except you know, the source and sync are different. And this will be watching Grouper for requests for things like new groups or changes in group membership and that sort of thing, creating the corresponding groups in Google, and keeping them synchronized after that. So if a student gets added to a group, we tell Google to add it to its group as well. And this will use the Google Drive API for sharing documents with groups, and also the Google Admin SDK for creating the groups and managing them after that. And so what we end up with is a system like this, where we have Sakai and Group at either end, sorry, Sakai and Google at either end, Group is sitting in the middle, and then a pair of sync jobs, which are more or less shuttling data between them. So one of the sort of key design decisions here is that we wanted everything to be asynchronous. So for example, rather than having an action performed by an instructor in Sakai trigger an immediate request to Google, we really just want that request to be logged to the database and then carried out asynchronously by a background job like one of these sync jobs we've seen. Uh, the reason we like that is because at NYU we run in a clustered environment, so we have I think, nine production nodes running at any single time. We don't want to be in a situation where the instructor has made a request and we're halfway through replicating some students to Google and all of a sudden we shut that one down to do an upgrade or it crashes or whatever. So we really like the idea of having the database be the sole source of truth and you know, we can take a request and we log it as pending and then later on we have this one of these background tasks carried it out, carrying it out. The other thing we're hoping to avoid is once we start talking about the Google API, we're talking about communicating across the internet. And it's just inevitable that at some point we won't be able to contact the Google API. And we would really like our NYU classes system to be up and available even while you know, NYU is off the internet, for example, or Google crashed or something like that. So having everything asynchronous should really help with that. OK, so we've, we've talked about the first part, creating the Google Groups based on the Sakai site memberships. Um, so we are aiming to have a pilot of that in uh, fall of this year. So one of the reasons we wanted to create that Google Groups tool is so that we could sort of roll it out in a gradual way so we could try a number of course sites, you know, have the group syncing, et cetera, and then roll it out on um, a wider basis to the university. Um, so, you know, that's what we are aiming for fall 2014 for the first part. So, uh, the second part, sharing Google Drive items with Sakai site members. So, we've shown how we can do this just in a manual way. You grab the associated email address, you pop it into a Google Doc, and you have sharing. But we wanted a way um, to make that sharing of Google Drive items easier and more integrated into the workflow of the resources tool. Um, so this next work is something that we would, um, we would aim for next year, so into the spring. And it would involve some changes to the, to the resources tool. So, so just basically, um, you know, if I want to add a link uh, in resources, I just say add, add web link. Um, and the workflow is fairly straightforward. I pop the link in and add it. Of course, if I did that with a Google Doc, I wouldn't be addressing um, the permissions uh, on that doc. So we're proposing um, the following modifications. So under Add, you would be able to add a Google item. And once a user clicks that, um, they would see a similar looking um, 
interface where they could add a web link. So once a web link is added, um, there would need to be a determination if this was an NYU Google Doc and if the user has the ability to share it. So if you don't have right uh, access on the doc, you're not going to be able to share it. Um, and through the through the API, we are the Google API. We're able to see that. So this process would look. Say, hey, do you have the ability? Um, and so it would pull back that item. So quiz questions is what that link corresponded to. And it tells me right up front that I only have read-only access. So when you try to share the Google Doc, you may have some kind of message that essentially says, this is read-only. You'd have to request right access to it. So that's one way that you could you know, try to share a Google Doc. But we wanted to provide a way to look directly into your, to your Google Drive. So Let's say if I clicked on the Select from Google Drive button there. So the, the Google Drive API will allow us to bring back a list of files for that given user's, um, in that given user's Google Drive. Um, the API supports pagination um, and allows us to pull back a specific number of results per page. So for example, if you had hundreds of items um, in your Google Drive, it would take a long time to pull back. Um, but you know, we we found that the the API will allow for pagination and um, set number of results, so we get around get around that. Um, it also la allows you to see the rights on documents. So in this case, you can see upfront what you can and what you cannot share um, to another user. Um, one thing we want to explore is there are obviously many variations of that. Sometimes you could have a link that you don't have edit rights on, but it's anybody with the link. So we wouldn't want to keep people from adding those types of docs because then they wouldn't have to do sharing. So um, we'll continue to sort of look into the API and see if we can pull all that information back so we can make sure that we, we surface that sharing information up front early for the user. And then, the, um, thankfully, the API supports um, some basic searching, so you're not just paging through uh, your Google Drive. So um, I'm gonna, I select a document at the bottom, Chicken Pants. And then, because that's the document that I am allowed to share, um, I would be able to see something in section two, which is share Google item. Um, and what I would see there is the list of groups, of Google groups that I've created for this Google site. Again, if I wanted to expand those sections and see you know, who exactly I'm sharing with, I could do that. So in this case, um, I'll select section one again, as we did before, um, to share with that group. Um, one thing that's not shown here, and this is some feedback that we got from our um, from one of our faculty groups is, you know, because you're sharing documents with courses and maybe you're giving them edit access, you want to know who else has rights to that document. So without going to Google Drive and opening it and seeing who else is in there, um, we want to show maybe at the bottom of this screen, maybe even in accordion or something like that, who else has rights to this document. And the API does support that. So that's something that we're aiming to implement. Okay, so we're proposing a few um, a few updates to the resources tool to support this workflow. So the the first thing that you that you really want to know is is this a Google Doc um, you know that that I'm dealing with? Um, and there are a couple of ways. So so the first thing we did was to add this type column over to the right. Um, that would apply to all resources and very clearly see if it's a Google Doc. And then also um, support, oh, I can use microphone. That's, that's great. I love technology. <laughs> um, then you can actually uh, you know, have a, a specific icon for, um, for a Google Doc or another Google item. One thing I want to mention, since I'm, since I'm over here, um, so this is, this is an icon for a Google folder. Um, so one thing a user could do is just add an entire Google folder to their Google Drive, have the permissions synced to that site, and then they can just dump as many Google Docs into that folder on the Google side. Those permissions would cascade down on the Google side, and so they wouldn't have to add resource after resource after resource here. Um, that was from our user advisory group. That was actually one of the ideas that came up, which is worded 
as I want to use Google Drive in place of resources in Sakai. Well, this is one way that some that approximates that a little bit. That you could just you you know you could use that whole folder. And let's see what else. What haven't I talked about? Oh yeah, um, that access column. Um, so we also felt and had feedback to this effect that you know when you have these Google documents out there. And if, say, you do, um, you are sharing with a number of students, and maybe you make some folks editors and whatnot, um, you want to be able to see at a glance who it's shared with. You also want to make sure that you haven't uploaded a Google Doc that you think is shared with your class, but really isn't. Um, so we wanted to surface that in the access column and make it clear if it was shared with the entire site or if it was shared with something other than the entire site. Sharing with the entire site would probably be um, you know, a, the most common use case, but you know, that's why we do pilots, we'll figure that out. Um, so in, in the case of um, chicken pants, how many times do I say that? In the case of chicken pants, if I click on um, custom, I would see I would see the list of groups that it's shared with. So at this point I could um, I could update those. We would this would also at the at the time that you pull it up, um, Mark did say everything would be, you know, Asynchronous. Um, one thing that in, in this area that we would sort of aim to not be asynchronous or very quick um, would be this ability to share um, to share and unshare with groups. Um, so if, for example, on the Google Doc side, if a um, if a group was removed, you'd want to see that reflected here. Um, so you'd want this to be a very accurate reflection of who has access to the document. So um, at this point, from resources, if you wanted to change the sharing, you could do it here. Click Update, and that would be updated um, on the Google side. Um, so again, the end result is, you know, that uh, the end result is to add a Google Doc, uh, or sorry, add a Google group based on the course site or groups within that site for the Google Doc um, with sharing. But in the second way that um, we've demonstrated, it's done a little more seam seamlessly through the resources. So, like I said, the development's still in work, and we have a few sort of our own open questions or sort of tricky parts um, that we've come upon um, that we're sort of thinking through, um, and maybe this will stimulate some questions from you all as well. Um, one is the copy and move function in resources. So when you um, normally when you uh, copy something from resources, it does make a copy of it. Um, there are two instances of it. If you're copying a Google Doc, would you just want to copy that link with all the associated people you know, on that doc or something else? So that's sort of an open question for us. The same applies um, for import from site. When you're, pulling, uh, when you're pulling resources from a previous semester site and it has all of those Google Docs with associated permissions, do you want to pull those forward? What are the rules around that? Um, so there's an, oh, there are different ways we can deal with it, um, and that's something we're exploring with users. Another open question for us is the, the degree to which we lock down Google Groups. So we can have the ability to have a, um, an admin owner for Google Groups, and then restrict the manager, which would be the instructor, restrict the manager or, um, permissions on that group as we see fit. So that's something we're still sort of working through what those permissions would be. Another that came up recently is what happens when you um, delete a Google Doc out of your resources? Um, do you want all the permissions to go away from that doc at that point? Um, our initial leanings are yes, um, but again, it's something that we want to test with users. And as we continue, more questions will more questions will come up. So that's where we are with the integration. Um, and I just wanted to open it to your questions. <coughs> yes, Pilar, happy <laughs> with you. Uh, have you guys looked into the uh, sort of the zip up and download all of your resources um, process? And I guess what would happen to the Google Docs in, in that scenario? Yeah, so, so this is referring to if you had a a zip, uh, zip file, and you uploaded it, and it and it would blow it out in the. Well, no, I'm, I'm 
sorry, yes, that's the same tool, but I'm thinking okay. of more at the end of the semester, you, you have a resources collection that's a mixture of files perhaps you've uploaded that are, are uploaded to the system as well as a, a folder that's pointing to Google, uh, Google resources, Google files and drive. Um, and then you choose to sort of export out all of those resources at the end of the semester as a big zip to sort of take it with you and download it and keep it. Um, what would the files look like that actually were Google? I mean, would they be perhaps links to them, or would they be absent uh, because they're not I, actually I there? I suppose they would just act as links. Yeah, it's just probably enough. But it's um, right. but also the other way, I guess, if you could upload a zip file. But I don't know how if people would do that mm -hmm. as much. Um, yeah, yeah. I think with that, they, you know, they would probably you know do the uploading, do the uploading on the Google side, and then hopefully maybe into a Google folder, and then just share that Google folder in yeah. that. Scenario. Looks great. By the way, very cool. Thanks. It's it's all a design. <laughs> that doesn't matter. With a little bit of testing. I'll touch base with you next summer. It's yeah, exactly. <laughs> so keep the pressure on. <laughs> um, how many schools use Google Apps for Education for here? Great. Other questions or ideas? Yes, in the back. Uh, you mentioned about uh, job optimization that comes to like social safety and social link, uh, which would uh, link the data from Sakai to Google. So are you using like the Sakai to job in the framework or is that something uh, external? Um, the product? The prototypes we've done so far have an external thing, but we may end up using the Sakai one. We're not actually sure yet. Do you have a single sign-on solution between Google and Scott? We do. Shovel it. Shovel it. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> Ideas? <laughs> Dreams? Can you manage the Google participants from Google Groups? Or is it only available through Sakai? Uh, Could you add yeah. other people on the Google side as well? And it yes. Works? Do they go back into Sakai? They don't. Do? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So that's that's one of the things we talked about early on is we we don't want this to be a sort of two way integration. Um, so and the same the same applies to so the same that applies to groups applies to docs. So if you wanted to um, add additional individuals. Um, to, a Google, to a Google Doc, that would be fine. It wouldn't be booted out or anything like that. And the same with um, the same with the Google Group. Although we have the um, you know we have the ability since we're not making instructors um, owners, we have the ability to you know, define how much capability they have in the group itself. I mean, like cha changing the group name, for example. I mean, that's something that could be a big problem. <laughs> so, like I said, that's something an area where we have to sort of Lock down some of those capabilities. Gary Shaw, from New York University. What version of Sakai are you currently developing against? So, um, for the <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so, <laughs> well, the groups tool would be um, the groups tool would be uh, you know, a new tool, um, so not not as relevant. Um, but for any changes against resources which are farther out, you know, we would be developing against ten. Um, looking forward to that. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense to commit to our current. So, have you tested what kind of do you get a preview for Google Docs in, in the version 10 resources, or is it just a generic Google Docs icon? Uh, preview, like a preview of the document? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's in 10. Maybe I'll look back to Nicola. <laughs> The Do they have doc the preview of documents in 10? Not to my knowledge, but it's just what ETS does some of that. Yeah, yeah that's okay. We were talking earlier about what are the inspirations for the way you know you can experience the daily. Some of the stuff around that are perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So do you expect a uh, user that exists in Sakai will automatically exist in Google Docs as well? Um, 
So if they, so at our at our institution, if um, if they exist in Sakai, um, with maybe some exceptions, they, they should exist in, um, in in Google. But it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be automatic. One thing we're contemplating, sort of with Grouper, is do we just take um, even prior to them creating the um, the Google group, do we store that information in Grouper and sort of let it sit in that middleware? Um, but yeah, so are, are you asking like could could there be a situation where you have a student in Sakai but they they don't they aren't in Google Apps? Not right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, I guess in that case, say if you had them in, you know, the whole site group, um, there would have to be some sort of error handling that would show like these people are were not added to the group because they're not part of, you know, the organ the Google organization. Say again, sir. It's two same jobs that you're thinking about. Though you don't have an exception experience with Grouper, so we're kind of figuring it out as we go. It's all very well documented, so I'm sure we'll be fine. We might pop along to the next section as well. <laughs> yeah, and we do have a Grouper consultant, which yeah. Yeah. we can do some things we can do. Any other questions? Okay. And if, if anybody, you know, if this is interesting <laughs> to your institution, if it's something that you're interested in collaborating on, um, perhaps, let's talk. All right, thanks so much.